Hi, everybody. I'm immigration lawyer John Kasrabi. Thank you for joining us for our Q&A that we do every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Pacific time. We're here live on YouTube, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on TikTok, on Instagram. And we have dozens and hundreds of clips and this come out of this. So there's a lot of content here. But for those watching live, especially, thank you for joining us. Uh, you also get a trans chance to win a free consultation or three different chances to win consultations that we do on the live show. So every 10 minutes, we announce a winner. All you got need to, all you need to do to join is to uh, you know like and subscribe wherever you're watching this and write consultation in the comment section. And my wonderful assistant Katrina will name off people every ten minutes or so to the end of the show. We are here every Wednesday, six p.m. Pacific time, where we come and just take general questions about U.S. immigration and do our best to answer them. It's not case specific stuff; it's uh, you know general kind of stuff. We have to have a private consultation to go in that much depth uh, about your particular case. But you, you know, get together, get the information you need to learn about this confusing scenario that is U.S. immigration that gets more and more confusing every day uh, for everyone involved, not just the people that are going through the immigration, even the lawyers, even the government. A lot of times this information is just not even written down somewhere, and it's almost as if they're making it up as they go along. So we're trying to help you kind of clarify what the deal is with all that kind of stuff. Now, before starting, I want to remind everybody that I have a guide I wrote called the Ultimate Marriage Green Card Guide. It's a free guide that breaks down the A to Z of the process with the fiance visa, the marriage visa, uh, to get you to know the idea that the situation around it and the strategy involved in it so that you can understand what's going on before you start or before you even talk with an immigration attorney. If you want to access that free guide, just go to marriageimmigrationlaw.com. It's marriageimmigrationlaw.com. You catch it there. And I also do for this quarter a weekly seminar on the EB1A green card. They call it the EB1A Extraordinary Playbook, where you go through the A to Z of the Extraordinary Ability Green Card. This is for the people that are top people in their field, whatever field that is. They have the potential of getting a U.S. green card. And I go through that whole process. It's around 45 minutes, a live webinar. We also take questions and stuff. Um, where you can get into that there. Um, it'll be a, it's an interesting session. It's always a lot of fun. So definitely join us there. If you want to you know, sign up for that and register for it, it's Fridays at 10.30 a.m. Pacific time. Just send me an email and I'll add you um, to the registration for that week so you could join it and catch up on it. Uh, other than that, uh, you know, there's a lot going on, but let's just start the show. So I'll start it off with, uh, with a question on, on Instagram. A gentleman asked, U.S. citizen can cancel a spouse's citizenship if they quarrel each other, if she is outside the United States. Okay, so um, the problem, that question is, people always misunderstand. Uh, it, it's, the situation is apparently there's a fight between a couple and one of them uh, may have applied for something for the other. A lot of times people say like, oh, I wanna apply for citizenship for somebody. You don't apply for citizenship for somebody. Uh, you apply for a green card first. This is lawful permanent residency in the United States. Once that person gets comes a lawful permanent resident, they can on their own apply for U.S. citizenship several years later if they match the requirements. So in this situation, if a person is worried probably fighting with their spouse, they probably have a green card case pending for them, not a citizenship case. Because that citizenship case, the, the, the quarreling doesn't matter. I'm not sure what's going on there. It's no, the, 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 the spouse and the other spouse can cancel it. Uh, but if it's a green card case that's not complete and you're fighting with your spouse, yes, unfortunately, they can uh, cancel the case. But there's a thing called the VAWA, the Violence Against Women's Act, which doesn't just apply to women. It applies to men, too, but they named it incorrectly like that. But under VAWA, if there's abuse, potentially, you can save the case and still get the green card if you could show there was you know, extreme abuse and stuff like that. So there is a chance to get cut off, but there are other options. If there's abuse, it really depends on the facts of the case. So we'd have to really analyze it there. Um, but it's it's a messy situation. I'm sorry that any of that has to happen. Um, it's a, it's an unfortunate thing to have to go through. So what's going on in immigration in general? As more questions are queuing up. You know, the immigration world uh, right now, we're dealing with a lot of Ukraine immigration. There's a program called United for Ukraine, which President Biden opened up to let people from Ukraine be able to come to the United States, 100,000 people, probably going to increase. There's TPS, Temporary Protective Status, that's announced for Afghanistan and for Ukraine, allows people to stay in the United States, if they're here, get a work permit and the like. Um, but, you know, the timelines are supposed to be getting faster in some sense, but not really. We're seeing some cases take even longer than before. And it's harder and harder to get congressional help even on these cases. So the situation with uh, with immigration is still uh, all over the place. Um, there was some good news out of India. Well, the U.S. Embassy there said they're reopening things. They're doing tourist visa interviews. So there's a... Essentially, no interviews being scheduled 
in India for people who wanted tourist visas to, to visit the United States. And on the Twitter for the U.S. Embassy mission, uh, they said in September they're going to open it up. So that's going to be a, a big help uh, for them to start, you know, getting people coming in and, and being able to do this kind of stuff. Um, but this basic scenario with a lot of cases of the embassy is in most parts right now, uh, people uh, just can't get an embassy interview. Or if they do, it's going to take a year or longer in large parts of the world. Not always. Some countries are fast and with no issue. But for India and Pakistan and Iran, Central Asia, Middle East, that's a big issue they're going to have to deal with. And even places like Mexico. Mexico always has delays anyways. Um, but with things that like tourist visas, that delay is out of control. So it's a, it's a peculiar situation. Um, it's between the pandemic and, and the leftovers of the Trump administration that we're dealing with a lot of these ups and downs in the immigration system. So it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a peculiar place to be in. Uh, it's a new world. Uh, and every time, um, you know, people call us uh, and have a consultation, we got to spend a good amount of time just going over the fact that you, the unexpected is what's going to be expected in this, in this game because we just don't know what's going to happen. Sometimes we have two cases that look exactly the same. One of them gets approved in three months or something like that. Then one of them goes over a year. You know, like, well, what's the difference? Why did this happen? Why did that happen? It's hard to say. And many times nowadays, lawsuits are required. Uh, I had a fiance visa case where um, the person went to the embassy interview uh, and then they made no decision. Three months go by, five months, six months, eventually have to sue them to make a decision, which they approve. And so there's like almost an additional filing fee you have to pay. You're dealing with the embassies after the interview for not approving it just to be able to sue the government uh, and for them to settle and then just give the visa and get done with it. So the prices just go up as part of the inflation of the immigration system. We have a question from Victoria Salm. How long does it take for an I-130 to be approved for a spouse of U.S. citizen? Typically, it takes between six to ten months, but I've seen it take longer and, and shorter. It's just one of those inconsistencies. Different service centers do different times. Now, when you send an I-130 uh, to USCIS, the petition elderly relative here applying for your spouse, um, the, the, the they go to a certain location. So you get a receipt that says the case is processing at a certain location. Um, I've had cases that where I check the time uh, on those kind of things, and they say, okay, this location is going to take this long, but it, I got case approved much faster. So it's really inconsistent in these time frames. Um, the key really is uh, that in, in your follow-up hours in California, you know, check the California Service Center times, but sometimes they'll tell you it's at the California Service Center on the paperwork. When we call them, they'll say, oh, we changed it. It's at a different location now. And they'll go, okay, so it may not even be there. Or you have two different officers in California. One takes a long time to decide, one takes faster. So unfortunately, you just gotta, the best thing you can do is have a clean case to try to avoid RFE, RFE excuse me. That's really the best you can do uh, and just wait. It's very, it's very a, a difficult situation. I've had these follows up on Instagram. If, you have, if a girl is having a green card and his spouse is a US citizen, so a US citizen can cancel his spouse's citizenship, they have conflicts. Now, if you have a green card, there's no one to cancel your citizenship. You just, uh, if I was, you got to talk with an attorney in private. The question doesn't fully make sense, uh, and there's a lot more going on. So it's just too case specific to be able to answer here, unfortunately. Um, we need to see what's going on in your private case uh, in private or something like that to be able to figure out what's going on. Um, so, yeah, and the situation is that when you, the, the problem that may happen, uh, going to kind of explain your aspect of this. Uh, is that when you apply for U.S. citizenship, you have to have a green card for at least, you know, so many years. Now, typically, is you have to have a green card for five years uh, for every general population. After five years, you can file for citizenship if you satisfy all the other requirements. But if you've been married and living with a U.S. citizen, then you can file for three years. So if the relationship goes bad with the citizen spouse while your case is pending for citizenship, uh, based on a three-year version, potentially it could be problematic. Um, and this is a problem I see a lot of immigrationers don't know this. Uh, for the three-year version, you have to have been living and married with your spouse in the same house uh, up until the time of filing. But if your relationship goes bad and you move out, it's still okay as long as you don't get a divorce uh, up until the oath ceremony. You just don't want to get a divorce finalized. That could become problematic. Um, so uh, it really depends on the timelines and when what we could prove and what documentation you have, all this kind of stuff. So it gets way too case-specific. And so that's why we need to jump in and figure those kind of things out at the appropriate time uh, in a private consultation. But you just really got to dive in deep to see what's going on in these kind of cases.
All right, seems like a little bit of a slow day today. Usually we're inundated with questions and the internet's not working too well. Uh, but I'll see our regular ask. Hi, John. What is the right number to talk to U.S. Uh, not right number to talk to U.S. live agents of the machine? Um, you, it's the one eight hundred number. You got to call uh, and 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 get a hold of them. Send it, depending on what your situation is. There's some some cheap secrets and stuff I can't put out necessarily, but um, you know that's the everything is the same number. You could always try ask Emma as well. We have a great question on uh, Lee, on Lee from LinkedIn. Sujita asks. If I have a DS-160 with an employer to schedule a visa interview in India, can I use the same DS-160 to schedule a visa interview after H-1B extension is approved with the same employer? Um, not necessarily. So when you fill out a DS-160, that DS-160 has a case, uh, the application number associated with it. And within that, you specify what the reason for your visa is. So um, I'm not sure if you can. Probably not uh, because you have to specify. I haven't done this particular scenario for an H-1B extension on that. So it depends on what it is. And that, that form, it might as well just do a new one. I mean, I don't know what the big deal is to throw out another DS-160 if you already have done one before. But I wouldn't even bother doing something like that. So um, it's, I don't know why you'd want to even use the same. I mean, I'm not sure what the big deal is to fill out a new DS-160. Um, the information uh, probably uh, has changed. So you just want the freshest information there. It just in almost no way does it make sense to try to reuse the DS-160 even for it's possible. I'm not sure if it's possible, but it just it wouldn't make any sense. It's, it's something to that could cause that problems for your case. So just fill out a new one. Uh, Latin guy asks, U.S. citizen can request a visa for spouse living abroad. So this is a question I get a lot. So if you're a U.S. citizen, you could apply for your spouse's green card. But when you say request the visa. Um, each person on their own requests the visa. No one requests the visa for me. So if you're going to apply for the green card, start the process with that, then that's the different story. But if you mean like can my spouse come and visit the United States, can I send them a, 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 a visitor request? Uh, that's not supposed to come from you. Um, the person goes um, and, and fills out an application for the embassy and, and asks, and that's really what it is. Um, and that's a big mistake a lot of people make. They say, oh, I want to bring my cousin here. Can I get him a visa? It's like, well, there's nothing that you do in this process. It's your cousin uh, who needs to apply for a visa, and uh, hopefully they'll get it. But it's not something where you can apply for in that way. Uh, I do want to announce our, our first winner for our raffle. Uh, Su Sujita, yeah, Sujata, I'm sorry. Sujata asked a wonderful question on LinkedIn. I'll take a screenshot where you're watching this so I can see, uh, you know, it's you. Uh, oh, and um, actually on LinkedIn, Sujata, too, you, either way, just uh, send me a message. Uh, and uh, I'll send you a link to schedule a free 15-minute video consultation um, so we can talk in private a little bit about what's going on. For those just tuning in, we give away free video consultations. All you got to do is like and subscribe um, to this channel and write a uh, consultation. And then uh, I'll announce somebody at 10 minutes and 20 minutes, uh, each of them, in a free 15-minute video consultation. If you haven't already, check out the Ultimate Marriage Green Card Guide and learn about the marriage green card process, the answer visa process. And really, it's about the general immigration process because like 80% of it overlaps. But uh, go to marriageimmigrationlaw.com, marriageimmigrationlaw.com. And if you're interested in EB1A, the Extraordinary Ability Green Card, join our weekly seminar that's going on right now. Get it while it's hot. Uh, it's called the EB1A Extraordinary Playbook. And uh, just uh, 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 re you can register by email me, uh, and I'll, I'll give you access. It's Friday at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, where you go through the A to Z of the immigration process for the EB1A Extraordinary Green Card. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, Tafatis follows up, can a pregnant girl respond to her mother at her delivery? Can a pregnant girl sponsor to her mother for at, at her delivery? So I think you're asking a woman's pregnant and she wants her mother to be there. Can she ask to sponsor her mother? So this is what I'm saying. You can't sponsor somebody to come here uh, in that sense. The mother could go and apply for a tourist visa to come and visit. It may or may not be granted. Um, it, that's, that's the best we can do, really. That's it. Uh, one of our regulars, Jordana, asked, hey, Miles, going? Doing okay. Uh, how important is signing up for the selective service before the age of 26, and what are the risks if I did not? Okay, this is, it can be very problematic. It's considered a crime not to do it, but I don't see them enforcing it. Um, but the selective service uh, is what a lot of countries have, which is mandatory military service. Uh, now, the U.S. doesn't force you to do military training, um, but they do mandate to make a mandate that if you're a U.S. citizen, green card holder, or you're here without status, you're unauthorized, you're illegal in a sense, to sign up between the age of 18 and 26. Now, if you're here on like a student visa, H-1B or something like that, you don't need to do that. 
Um, but if you're here again with some lawful status, like a residency status, citizenship, LPR, green card, or illegal without status, um, then you have to sign up for it. And it just, practically speaking, is it becomes a problem for getting student loans or something like that if you go to college. And for immigration purposes, it's problematic because if you didn't sign up, you won't be able to apply for U.S. citizenship um, until three or five years after age of 26, depending on which version of citizenship you're applying for. Now, one thing to note is many times, if not most times, if you adjust status in the United States from I-485, USCIS will automatically apply for you. You might not even know it. It's submitted for you. So what you got to do is just go to Selected Service Draft website. You put your name and social security number in there and it lets you know if you've been registered. Now, you might be registered and you didn't even know it. Um, but it's an important question because it's uh, very unexpected. A lot of people don't even know that there's a thing called Selected Service Draft. Um, they're supposed to tell you. They don't many times. Um, but it's really important to know. So I'm glad you brought it up. Hopefully we've made a clip out of this and get this information out more. Um, but Jordana, hopefully, uh, Jordan, hopefully uh, I hope you signed up or they signed you up. Patrick, I said, hello, John. I applied for my marriage green card in May 2021, and we had our interview October 2021. I got my combo card and my social security number in De uh, December 2020, and still my status under review. What should I do? So you had your uh, interview a long time ago. Either the there, you know, it could be nothing. It could be just they forgot about it. Try sending a letter there or have a congressperson contact them. Or it could be your interview just didn't go well and they're doing an investigation into your case. Uh, I don't know how well your interview went or what they did there, but uh, it's been six months. It's kind of it's kind of bad, but sometimes they just lose stuff too. So it's not necessarily like you're going to get denied, but it could be that they have an investigation in your case because the interview didn't go well and they have questions. So it's going to take a while to get approved. Um, you should talk more in private just to go over what happened at the interview, look at your application package to see what if red flags were there, and then just hope for the best. And sometimes you can sue them if you wanted to for the delay, but it's a, it's a tricky situation. It's outside the norm for sure um, to wait that long. I'm sorry about that. Dwayne asks, how are you doing, John? Yeah, doing, doing better. It's a little, a little bit tough week uh, for me, but it's, I'm doing much better now. Thanks for asking. Patrick Will says, is it safe to travel outside the States if I still didn't get my green card? Um, no, it's not safe because if you get a denial, you're stuck outside. So I wouldn't travel. Good question. Michael asks, why is I-751 taking so long to process? So the I-751 removal condition is the is if you have a two-year green card based on you know being married uh, for a shorter period of time with your sponsoring spouse, um, they, they have to double check uh, your case by submitting this additional paperwork called Form I-751. Now it's a low priority for USCIS in their mind. Uh, getting the green card is priority, so you get the green card, and citizenship is really important, so they, they put off their citizenship. But I-751s, they say, and this is what they're open, the reports are, what they say is, you already have a green card, you're here, so you're not in a rush. So the, the limited resources they have, they put towards getting the green card in the first place and for citizenship, and it's extremely low priority for the I-751, less officer time for it, which means massive, massive delays. So what the thing to do is, if you file for citizenship while the I-751 is pending, it usually permits them to speed things up um, because this, the officer doing the citizenship case, maybe could just finalize the I-751 for you. So that's the technique to do it. Um, unfortunately, sometimes people come to me, I-751 has been pending two years and they haven't filed for citizenship yet and just waste all that time. Um, it's not a foregone conclusion that's going to work, but that's what typically you could do to get these cases up and running. Um, but sorry, it's going through that. I do want to announce our winner for our second free consultation raffle, Patrick Gould. Let's have a chat, a uh, quick one, um, if, about what happens. Uh, take a screenshot of where you're watching this and so I can see your username and email to me at info at jqklaw.com. I'll send you links so we have a quick chat to see what happened at the interview. Um, for those just tuning in, we give away free video consultations. We've got one more to give away, and all you got to do is like and subscribe and write uh, consultation in the comment section. And my wonderful assistant, Katrina, will name someone off in about 10 minutes or so. And uh, we'll, we'll get that in so we have another talk with somebody else trying to give out some free advice in private because there's only limited stuff we can talk about here. If you haven't already, download the Ultimate Marriage Green Card Guide. Learn about the marriage and fiancé visa process by going to marriageimmigrationlaw.com. If you're interested in the EB1A Extraordinary Ability Green Card, go to uh, uh, no, go to uh, anyone and learn more about it. I'm going to give you a live seminar uh, on, on Fridays at 1030 a.m. Pacific time. Um, it's the only limited number of, of seminars left I'm going to do on this. So if you're interested, email me. I'll give you information on, on in getting into that seminar where you can have a small chat uh, with a small group going over the A to Z and basics of the EP1A Extraordinary Ability Green Card. 
All right, so next jump to the next question. Uh, Fahad said, ask, I have a two-year green card and I, and I submit the rule conditions, but I have a complete, but I have complete my three years. Um, I think, can I still apply for N400? Probably can. I just talked about this in a lot of detail, like, you know, a minute ago. Um, I don't know the details of your case, so I can't say if you could do that. Um, but generally speaking, if you satisfy the citizenship requirements based on marriage to a U.S. citizen spouse, uh, even while the I-75 was pending, you can file for an N-400, uh, whether it's appropriate in your case or not. I can't say because I need to know more details about you and your background and the like. Uh, but that's a that's a technique to do. That's that's what I um, that, that's what I usually do for my clients. Uh, it's a very important thing to do. All right. So what happens? So let's let's go through the process of, of all this. Go. So you get the marriage green card. Once you got it, if your marriage is new, you get a two-year conditional green card, which means you have to file form I-751. Uh, two years after getting the green card. There's a 90-day window of the file, but I might go into that much detail. Once that's filed, it takes anywhere from six months to 12, two years to get it approved. Um, because the green card does expire, they do give you a, 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 a receipt that acts as a two-year extension of the green card. And then while that's pending, and once a year goes by, you hit the three-year mark or close to it, you file for U.S. citizenship. So we typically do that. And what then happens is when the citizenship interview happens for most part, not always, but almost there, nowadays, almost always, um, and the I-751 is still pending, the officer will just make a decision on both those cases at the same time and knock them both out. And so that's why it's really a good idea for most cases to file for citizenship while the I-751 is pending because it'll force things to, uh, because I-751 is not clear when it's going to get done, but the citizenship case is more consistent and they have more attention to that. So that can really force things forward. Uh, it's going to be an important part of the process. Now, going to the EB1A, I've been talking about a lot in the last couple of weeks. I've been tuning in is the extraordinary ability of green cards for people who are top in their field. It doesn't have to be, you know, the most famous actor, the famous scientist. Unfortunately, the press has this idea that it's the Einstein visa, or genius visa. Couldn't be farther from the truth. Some of the people get this green card, the dumbest people in the world. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but um, it just, it really depends on if you're really good at what you do. And, you know, America wants to gather these people who are top their fields. Why not? So um, that's where they create this category, EB1A Extraordinary Ability. We help people from all different fields. Obviously, see, there's the arts fields, actors, singers, comedians, artists, and painters and stuff like that. I've helped with, uh, I've helped with athletes who are karate people, um, you know, uh, football players. Uh, all this kind of different different stuff of uh, football, foreign football, soccer, uh, and all that stuff. But there's people who are big business people with health. You know, top lawyers, uh, dentists, uh, people are scientists. It, and, and it really goes to nuances of anything you really do. You know, uh, just figure out if you're one of the best. If you're the best couch maker or, or furniture maker or handcrafter, you could do it. So uh, this definitely something to look forward to um, if you're interested in it. It requires a lot of paperwork, and you have to prove in different ways you have this ability through awards and articles about you, and maybe so you make a lot of money, and you judge people's work in this. You have your world, world renowned in different ways. You have to be able to document how good you are, which comes really hard to do, and that's where most of the work is. Um, but it's something to look into. So let's get some questions on Instagram. Uh, Osku asks, "What is what is this when you give this a message is changed?" Um, Okay, so they're saying uh, the online stats for USAC says we're actively reviewing your form I-130 to show your relative. That just means they started, you know, reviewing it and, and they're in the process of looking at it. That's about it. Uh, it doesn't mean much more than that. Dwayne asks, uh, hey, John, question. Could I send a letter from my wife to the field office? Uh, I do my interview or send it to the lockbox. Um, hey, John, could I send a letter from my wife to the field office? I do my interview or send it to the lockbox. Uh, it depends on Dwayne. I can't. I don't, I'm not sure you referenced the previous question on here, um, but it depends on what the letter is and what the situation is. It's I, I can't tell you. It's just way too much stuff um, that's going on there. Um, and and it's if, if it's your wife, she needs to send the letter. Uh, it really depends on exactly what that unique situation you're dealing with is. I can't I give that general kind of information. Sometimes we send it to both, so it's on the record. Because I've had times where we send stuff to local office and doesn't make the file. So we send it to both just so everyone gets it. We make sure it goes in the immigration file. But I, I wouldn't recommend sending something to the government without knowing what it is. So I, I especially I, I can't answer that question directly. Hamsas, I just submitted I-130 and it says it's being uh, being reviewed and so the case was received. It's only two days. It is what it is. Don't worry. The, the thing about the USIS.gov updates, stuff like that, they're not reliable. They, they don't always update them. Uh, I wouldn't really pay, pay much attention. If you got the receipt notice, you got it, um, and that's it. I don't don't check stuff. Don't check timelines. 
there's not much the information is going to do that helps you in any way. Unless they say you got an RFP or something. Uh, TikTok fam asks, how old brothers and sisters should be to file a green card for them if I'm a citizen? There's no age limit. So if you're a U.S. citizen and you are 21 yourself, then you can apply for uh, siblings of any age. There's no limitation uh, on the age. Um, we have a question here on Instagram. Lucky asks, how to accelerate the timing for the visa interview? It, 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 unless there's an emergency that you can expedite, there's not much you can do. Uh, also, he asked, and do back taxes affect processing times? Um, it depends on what kind of case you have. I'll ask you, uh, I can't remember your previous question. Um, it, it, it could affect things for the affidavit of support, depending on what kind of case you have. So that's something um, that you're going to deal with. My tool says sit. Well, no, I'm standing. It's all good, brother. Um, so, you know, taxes do come and play a role in immigration. For citizenship, you have to show that, you know, you have, you have to be able to say that you've always filed your taxes and everything like that. And when it comes to, uh, you know, a marriage green card case or family base, there's an affidavit of support requirement. If you're back due taxes, potentially, that could be problematic. So you submitted I-130, taxes don't matter for the I-130, but later on, for not, uh, inevitably I-130, and, and unless you have a unique kind of case, there's an affidavit of support requirement. And you have, if you haven't filed your taxes, that's going to pop up for the affidavit of support. In your case, if you just filed I-130, it means you're doing constant processing, and you have to deal with that later. Uh, we have some questions on TikTok. Um, so I uh, I applied I-130 without social security number because petitioner just came, and we're still waiting on social security number. So, you know, on the I-130, it does ask uh, for social security numbers. Um, I had a case once when we, we didn't put one. It was okay. Uh, hopefully, you get the social security number. Con call the social security office. Try to get it. So if you have an RFP, you have an answer. But it's not the biggest deal. Social security number really comes a problem for the affidavit of support because that's where you need to show taxes and stuff like that. So you really want to have it at that time. Probably you'll be okay, but can't say for sure. Maito follows up from his uh, comment about sitting. He's asking, sir, my category is F4 March 22913. Um, and my sister's in Chicago. I'm from India. How much waiting? Well, check out the visa bulletin uh, and see what's going on there for people born in your country uh, in the F4 category. And you'll always have your answer there. So check out visa bulletin off of uh, Google. You can search it. The Department of State website comes. Um, TikTok fam asks, how long does it take for a sibling from Nepal, probably around 15 years uh, before you start that. If you're a U.S. citizen, you apply for a sibling, probably around 15. It can go up and down, but that's generally it. All right, so we have time for a couple more questions if you want to get it. We have a question on Instagram. It says, I have a 10-year green card, but I got stuck for seven months out of the U.S. Can I apply for citizenship on marriage-based? Um, they're going to potentially hassle you about this, uh, this over six months trip that you have there. So this person is a green card holder, it was outside the United States for seven months. Because you're outside for more than six months, uh, when you do apply, potentially they could deny the case because you're outside for more than six months. You need to have a really good reason and be able to show that your residency was really in the United States, not outside, um, and you had proof that you're residing here. And uh, it's case specific, fact specific, it's up to the officer's discretion. So it um, you could give it a shot, but we would need to analyze it and see what happens. And at the end, it will be up to the discretion of the immigration officer uh, if they uh, if they want to prove it. Uh, we have a question on TikTok. Can I file for siblings and next day I'm a citizen? Yeah, as soon as you're a citizen, you can start submitting as many I-130s as you want. Um, that, that is, uh, usually what we do for our cases, when I have a, a client who's about to get citizenship and we know they could file for like their parents or stuff like that, um, I uh, immediately uh, have everything prepared, the I-130, so as soon as they get their naturalization certificate, and we get a picture of that, we send it the next day to not delay any time. So we have our last winner for our free consultation raffle, Max it soft one two three. Thank you for watching. Uh, take a screenshot where you're watching this, so I know it's you. And email to me at info at jqklaw.com, and we can schedule a private video consultation talk for a bit, fifteen minutes, um, uh, to see what's going on with your case. So we got a couple of questions. Briz asks, can a TPS holder can bring a spouse from another country? Uh, no, unfortunately, if TPS holder can't uh, bring people in, so only helps themselves. And Fianca asks, how long does F3 processing take? Uh, I don't know. It may, I don't know, like 13 years or something like that. Uh, check out the visa bulletin for that. On Instagram, um, we have a question. Um, and last question, actually. Jaja asks, uh, how can I ex expedite EAD a work permit so I can improve our family situation since I'll not be able to work? It really affects our relationship. 
Um, you need to have a good reason to contact USCIS and request an expedite and explain for what are humanitarian, whatever reason you need it, and hope for the best. Really, that's all it is. Um, and that's that. Sorry about the situation. Hope you get it. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. I'll see you all next Wednesday, 6 p.m. Pacific time. If you're interested in the EB1A green card and want to join the private seminar we're having, their Q&A seminar, breaking down the, the whole process, email me at info.jqklaw.com, and I'll give you the information. Join then Friday at 10.30 a.m. Pacific. It'll be a lot of fun. And until next week, God bless. Be safe, everybody. Bye-bye.